Hey everyone, it's Bella and welcome back. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all having an incredible day. I hope you're having an incredible start to the new year because this is going to be my first video of the new year. Hopefully 2021 will be better than 2020 because that was an absolute doozy of a year. We're starting the year off with an absolutely crazy case that I'm going to be telling you guys about today and also of course some incredible earrings from Hungry Lala. Had to start the year off with a bang, right? But before we do get into the video, I just want to quickly thank today's sponsor, Audible. You guys know by now that I love Audible. I've been talking about them for years. I've been using them for years. Audiobooks are amazing. I love to put them on literally when I'm doing everything. I just always need there to be some sort of background noise. I don't know why, but I just need something. So audiobooks are perfect. I have them on when I'm doing my makeup, when I'm driving, when I'm cleaning, like literally scooping out the kitty litter, I will be listening to an audiobook because I just need some background noise in my life. It's always better if that background noise is something you actually find interesting, like a good audiobook or something that you find interesting and you can learn while you're doing stuff. But currently I have been loving this series that my friend has been recommending to me forever. It's called A Throne of Glass series, I think. I'm on the second one at the moment called Crown of Midnight and I would recommend them, even though I'm only on the second one of the series, I'm really enjoying them so far. But, you know, if that's not your vibe, they have so many different genres. If you guys like my Mystery Mondays, there are so many, like thousands and thousands and thousands of true crime books. I do love to listen to audiobooks on the cases that I'm doing. I find them so interesting. Like there's one on this case and there's one on a bunch of different cases I've done in the past. Like I recommended one about the Ken and Barbie killers previously, which was really good and so interesting. And you guys can also get a 30 day free trial to check it out if you want with the link in my bio. It's just audible.com slash Bella or you can also text Bella to 500 500. All Audible members get one free credit every single month to get like a title from their bestsellers and new release sections. You can get to keep it forever and just read it over and over and over again as much as you want. And members also get access to their Plus catalog, which has thousands of audiobooks, podcasts, guided workouts, and meditation, which is amazing. And you can listen to them as much as you want. So definitely make sure to head to that link and give it a go. And let's go ahead and get into today's case. Also, my eyes are so sore right now. I always get asked in my videos if I'm either cooked or if I've been crying, when in reality, I just have these three massive lights in front of me so that you can see me, and I have really sensitive eyes. And the two just don't go well together. So my eyes are just always red so that you guys can see me in this little dark room. I need to start filming in the bedroom again so that I can film with natural lighting and my eyes can just relax. Anyway. <laughs> So today we're going to be talking about a crazy case which you guys may or may not have heard of called the Powell family case. It's about Susan Powell, her husband Josh Powell, and the two children, Charlie and Brayden Powell. So let's talk a little bit about them. The father, Josh Powell, was born on the 20th of January in 1976 to Steve and Terry Powell. He was born in Puyallup, which is in Washington, and he was one of five children. He had two brothers named Jonathan and Michael, and two sisters named Alina and Jennifer. And he really didn't have the best childhood growing up. His parents had a super dysfunctional marriage, mainly because his dad was a massive creep, which is why his mother filed for divorce in 1992. They had to go through this long, icky custody battle, long divorce proceedings before the divorce finally settled in 1994. I mean, it's never a good time for kids when their parents are going through a divorce, but this was like particularly messy. Steve was like accusing Terry of practicing witchcraft when in reality she was just like a herbalist and a naturalist and like to make her own tea. And then there was Steve who was like, hey, I think I should be allowed to marry another woman. And then was like all upset when Terry was like, hey, I don't think that sounds like a great idea. And he was also like addicted to pornography and he would show his children, like really young children from a young age, graphic pornography and it was just like really weird and gross. Apparently he was also really abusive towards the kids and Josh in particular, he at one point was like beating him every single day for like a month straight. All of this stuff was happening while Josh was growing up, he was young, he was at an impressionable age, and it was having an effect on him and his personality, and he was lashing out. Like, there was this one time where his mum, Terry, was like, hey Josh, can you do the dishes, which is totally reasonable and normal, and he pulled a butcher's knife on her and was like, don't push it, mum. And when he was just 13 or 14, he attempted suicide by hanging himself. 
Somehow at the end of the custody battle, I don't know how, but Steve managed to get custody of the two boys and Terry got custody of the two girls. And then one of the girls, Alina as well, went to live with her father. I think that he had like this really bad manipulative hold on them. By 1998, Josh had moved to Seattle and he was attending the University of Washington. And shortly after starting university, he met his first girlfriend through the Latter-day Saints church, which he was a part of. He went to this local LDS singles ward and he met a woman named Catherine Everett. And they moved moved in together and I mean things started off pretty well but he got very controlling very fast. He would restrict her, he would tell her what she could and couldn't do, like she couldn't go and see her family without him, he would restrict her from doing that, he would always have to be there to supervise and then one day she went to Utah to visit a friend and he didn't come and she just never went back to Seattle and she called him up and broke up with him over the phone and just never went back. In November of 2000, Josh met 19 year old Susan Cox at a dinner party where there was like a few people from the LDS church and they were all having dinner together. Susan was born on the 16th of October in 1981 in New Mexico to Judy and Chuck Cox. She was described by her family as outgoing, optimistic. She was said to just be a really kind person and she was very religious, very dedicated to her faith. She and Josh were both part of the LDS church. They were both Mormon and they just got along really well. They moved super quickly and they got married just a few months later in April of 2001 at the Portland, Oregon temple. Immediately, Susan's family didn't like Josh. They thought he was opinionated. They thought he was really self-centered. They just didn't like him. But between him and Susan, at least for the first few years, as far as everybody knows, everything was going relatively well. Josh graduated from a university with a bachelor's degree in business. And for the first few years, he had a few different jobs. He worked in real estate, he worked in web design, but he was really struggling to like hold down a job. So they lived with Josh's father, Steve, in South Hill in Washington for a little while to save some money. But like I said, Steve was a massive creep and I'll get more into detail about that a little bit later on, but Susan started to feel pretty uncomfortable living with him. Josh was being kind of a dick as well while they were living with his dad and he would blame Susan for feeling uncomfortable. And so she just kind of chalked it up to, okay, Steve is a really bad influence on him. That's why he's acting this way. And so they move. They move to West Valley City in Utah, where Susan, who was a trained cosmetologist, got a job at Wells Fargo Investments. And they started their family here. On the 19th of January in 2005, Susan and Josh had their first son, Charles. And then two years later, on the 2nd of January in 2007, they had their second son, Brandon. Now, like I mentioned, Susan wanted to move because she felt uncomfortable around Steve and she felt like Steve was a bad influence on Josh. So she thought they'd move, they'd get a fresh start, they'd start a family and everything would be great. But unfortunately that wasn't the case or I wouldn't be sitting here making this video. After the move, Susan made friends pretty easily through the church because she was like a bubbly, friendly person, but Josh, not so much. Susan met this one friend in particular that she was really close to named Kiersey Howell, and she met her through the church. She met her in Utah after the move, and Kiersey said that pretty much none of Susan's friends liked Josh. They all thought he was super controlling and kind of self-absorbed, and... Susan would vent a lot about her life and her relationship with Josh to Kiersey. Susan told her that she wasn't allowed to use the family minivan unless Josh specifically permitted her to. And she said that they had two main issues in their marriage, which were finances and faith. You know, a lot of the time when couples are going through tricky situations financially, it can have a massive strain on the relationship, which did seem to be the case here. Josh filed for bankruptcy in 2007. He claimed he was like $200,000 in debt, and it just seemed to be having a really negative impact on them. He would expect Susan to buy groceries at like ridiculous prices that didn't exist anymore. He would make her write down this like little spreadsheet or document every single time they went to the grocery store and she would have to say exactly what they bought and exactly how much it cost. Like it was so ridiculous. He would starve his two sons to the point where like they got one meal at daycare each day and he would be like, okay, well, why would I feed them again? They're just going to poop it out. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but just like what, <laughs> what the heck? That is not how food works. <laughs> and then Susan would have to call her friends and be like, hey, can I please borrow some food? Can I borrow some hot dogs? My two sons are crying because they're so hungry, but 
I have to document every single thing I spend money on. I have to document every single price of every single item at the grocery store. I have nothing here to feed my children. And I don't want to blame anyone here, but if these friends are like reporting that this has happened and they know that it's bad and that the whole relationship was bad, they knew that he was really controlling, why didn't anyone say anything? Like if he was starving their children to the point where she would have to ask her friends to borrow some food, I just don't know why nobody said anything or contacted anyone. Anyway, on top of this, apparently he would say things to Susan like, yeah, our marriage will be fixed if you make me good food and if I have good food in my stomach. And he would tell her like, hey, the reason I'm mean to you is because of the Republicans and because of the economy and the environment and like the economy is so bad that we're probably going to have to move overseas. I mean, obviously a little cuckoo. At one point, Susan told him that she wanted control of her own income mostly because she wanted to be able to pay, I don't know if it's called tipping or teething, to the LDS church that she was a part of. And this is basically where you pay 10% of your income to your church. And he would basically tell her that she's a religious fanatic, that if she paid this like little 10% to her church, that she would go to hell. On top of this, he apparently completely withdrew affection from her. He wouldn't touch her, he wouldn't hug her, wouldn't kiss her, wouldn't hold her hand. And apparently Susan knew the exact date that her two children were conceived because like they never had sex. It was the only time that they had sex. Now, get this, apparently when Susan was in labor with their first son, Charles, she had to get a lift with, or she had to call her parents to ask them to give her a lift to the hospital because Josh said he was too busy backing up his computer. I mean, first of all, you don't even need that to watch your computer back up. What a nerd, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But like, you don't need to be there to watch the computer back up. And second of all, he literally made his wife get a lift to the hospital, miss the birth of his firstborn child. Like, I don't think he got there till like two hours after Charles was born because he was too busy watching his computer back up. It's like watching grass grow. Now Susan did try to leave. She threatened to call the police and he just like laughed at her. He threatened her. He said that if she did that, if she left, if she called the police, that she would never get to see her children again. Eventually she managed to convince Josh to go to counseling, but you know, he just didn't participate. And then eventually he just stopped going altogether and things just continued to get worse. There's this really eerie video that Susan took where she went through their entire house just like documenting every single thing they had. I think it was like really common for like house insurance in case there was a fire or a flood or you know whatever the case may be. It wasn't like necessarily a weird video or like a weird thing to do to just have a record of everything you have. And I don't know if this is what her video was specifically for because she was going through and she was just like talking shit about Josh the whole time. Like she would go through and be like, this TV is Josh's specifically. This computer is Josh's specifically. Josh didn't help me with this and Josh didn't do that. And that hole in the wall, that was from Josh. It was just like, especially now, like after everything happened, it's definitely a very eerie video. Uh, this is me, July 29th, 2008, it is 1233, mountain time, um, covering all my bases, making sure that if something happens to me or my family or all of us that our assets are documented, hope everything works out and we're all happy and live happily ever after as much as that's possible. And this is Josh's computer, and there's some type of backup device and speakers. And here's the kind of pimping out stuff he's done to his computer. Josh locked this, but this is all of his files. See, locked. Those are his files. Here is a rigid saw. I don't know the differences. I think this is a chop saw. Oh, there we go. It says miter saw utility vehicle MSUV. This is all stuff bought in a year or less through Home Depot on my credit. Josh bought a lot of stuff and then he had to bankrupt it. And then he bought a little bit more on my credit. Josh felt the need to pull the mirror out and cut more holes in the wall. Said he was going to make shelves. That didn't happen. And I had necklaces too. I don't know where those are. I got in a rage, as you can see, and broke this. There's duds and pearls 
and opals in there. Broke this and threw all my DVDs and made a mess. Because he was angry at me was about a year or two back. So now we're at December 6th in 2009. It was a Sunday, so she and the two boys went to church in the morning and then they walked home because she wasn't allowed to use the car. One of Susan's friends came over that afternoon and she left at about 5 p.m., which is when Susan went for a nap. And that friend being there that afternoon is the last time anyone outside of the Powell family household ever saw Susan. The next morning on the 7th of December, Susan was meant to drop her boys off at daycare, but she never showed up. And she always dropped the boys off at the same time every single day. So when she didn't show up, it was definitely like a noticeable thing. Like it was a weird thing. The daycare tried multiple times to call Josh and Susan. They got no answer. So they decided to call their emergency contact, which was Josh's sister, Jennifer. She was like the only normal one from the Powell family. The only one that decided to continue living with their mother, Terry. She had no idea where they are. Her mum, Terry, didn't have any idea where they are. And it just all seemed a bit weird. So she decided to go to the Powell house to check on them, see what was going on. But when she knocked on the door, when she called out to them, there was no one there. So she decided to contact the police because she was worried that maybe the whole family had died in their sleep from carbon monoxide poisoning. And when the police got there, they made the decision to break into the house. When they get inside though, they don't find anyone. Nobody's there, but Susan's phone and her wallet are there. So immediately it's weird because like, where would she go without them? Or why would she go anywhere without them? There were also these like two big box fans that were pointed specifically at these points in the carpet that were like wet, like somebody had recently tried to clean them and was trying to dry them super quickly, which is just sketchy. So everyone's just trying to call Josh and Susan now. Josh's family, Susan's family, friends, you know, everyone's trying to call them and none of them are answering. Then at like 5 or 6 p.m., Josh just like randomly rolls up to the house like it's nothing. And the neighbor's like, hey, everyone has been looking for you. Like, you should probably go and tell the police where you are. So he goes to the police and he's like, hey, I'm here. I heard you were looking for me. So get this, he claims that he took his two children, Charles and Brandon, to Simpson Springs. He took them camping. And like, okay, sure, maybe camping would be innocent enough, but he just randomly decides at midnight to take his two kids two hours away to Simpson Spring in the middle of the blizzard. Like there was literally a blizzard that night. And he did this because his kids wanted s'mores. Like, the, the two kids that you don't feed wanted s'mores, so instead of making them in the kitchen, you decided to drive them two hours away to Simpson Springs to a campground in the middle of a blizzard at midnight to make them over a campfire. It just, it makes so much sense. The police are like, okay, why didn't you call in to work and tell them you weren't going to be coming? And he goes, oh... It's a Monday. I thought last night was Saturday night. Didn't realize I had work today. Oh, silly me. He said that Susan wasn't with them and he didn't know where Susan was, but he just seemed so unconcerned about it. He's like, oh, well, she probably just took the day off work and, you know, I was just hanging out with some friends or something. It's fine. It's all good. No wasses. Now, for some reason, the police didn't believe this story. Crazy that. So on the 10th of December, the police go out to Simpson Spring Campground to have a look around and they don't find any evidence of like a crime or a struggle, but they also don't find any evidence of a campfire, which Josh was like really specific about. Like he said, I drove two hours out there to make s'mores and as I was toasting the marshmallows, I realized I forgot the chocolate. The thing that you drove two hours out there to do apparently at midnight in the middle of a blizzard and you forgot something for it. So he said they just had marshmallows on crackers, but no sign of a campfire that had been lit any time recently. So police brought him in for two formal interviews after that and he kind of kept giving them the same answers and then by the third time that they wanted to bring him in for a formal interview, he lawyered right up. Alright. When did you guys get married? What year did you get married? Uh, 2000. Uh, it's probably in a blank. I think it was 2000, but either that or it was 2001. Okay. And it was in April. <coughs> April? Yeah, yeah, actually April 6th. Okay. And you're going to have to wait here with us. You're not going to go anywhere. Um, 
one of our detectives just uh, interviewed your children. And uh, your children are telling our detectives that uh, mom went with you guys last night. And that she didn't come back. She did not go with us. Okay. Well, with that, just getting that information, you're not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to let you leave. I'm going to detain you. you. Sit right here. If you want a lawyer and you want to talk or you want to change your mind and talk or take a CBSA test, um, then we can do those things. But <clears throat> okay, now with that in mind, they know that she didn't go with us. Well, here's the thing. Kids, kids are very honest. That's one thing I've learned in the years of doing this job. That when kids talk to us, we'll listen because they're honest. And they, 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 they never lie. They don't make things up. So if they're saying they were with you, they were with you. Okay? She, I mean, she was with you. So I have to believe the kids. So now it's going to be up to you if you want to help us find her and help us get to the bottom of what really happened here. He was named a person of interest after this, but not an official suspect because there was just no evidence. There was no evidence that anything had happened. Then just one month after Susan disappears of January 2010, Josh just up and moves with his two kids to Puyallup Up in Washington to live with his creep dad, Steve. Which is so weird because if your wife was missing, wouldn't you stay there and look for her? Or stay there in case she comes back? Like, I don't know, it just seems really bizarre to me. I feel like you'd give it a little bit more time than a month. Police continued to look into Josh as a suspect. They got a search warrant for the minivan, for the Powell household, they looked in the Utah mountains, but they never found any sign of Susan or any sign of like a struggle or anything. And the search for Susan Powell continues. Just last week, West Valley City Police following up on new leads, searching these abandoned mines in the Nevada desert for clues. This case just blows up in the media and Josh is doing interviews, he's maintaining his innocence and he says Susan just up and left on her own, that she was mentally unstable and that her mental illness is what caused her to leave. In November of 2010, in an interview with the Salt Lake Tribune, Josh just straight up blames her parents for causing her to leave. He was like, they always expect her to be this perfect person, there was too much pressure on her, and so she left and she's not going to come back while they're still the way that they are. What is the truth? People who know me know that I'm a good dad, I work hard, I put my sons first. I was a good husband, I took care of my family. And I see you're still wearing your wedding band. Yeah. You still love her? Yeah. I guess you could say that I still love her. At times, he stopped the interview, claiming he needed time to collect himself. Why take your two young sons camping after midnight, freezing cold temperatures? Well, we just go out and do things that are fun. But it's after midnight. You know, shouldn't your sons be sleeping? Weren't they sleeping? People who know me know that time is hard for me to keep track of. I tend to be spontaneous. I do things in the spur of the moment. While Josh and his father, Stephen Powell, have been making parts of Susan's old journals public, claiming it provides possible reasons for her disappearance. What do those journals tell you about Susan's life growing up? Susan was very emotionally abused as a child. Her mother has some very, she has a very angry personality. Her father is very manipulative. Josh says he thinks Susan may still be alive and wonders if she left him and their two young children for another man, a claim police will not substantiate. Has she ever been unfaithful to you? Never that I know of. Then why do you think that she would just run off with another man? She's a very sexual person. I mean, I'm, I'm her father-in-law, and uh, she, she would do a lot of things that, that um, I mean, she was just, she did it. I did, I mean, we, we interacted in a lot of sexual ways because 
Susan enjoys doing that. Now, on the 25th of August in 2011, things get really creepy. So Steve and Josh start releasing these pages from Susan's journals from when she was a kid, basically trying to paint her as like this sexual deviant. And then Steve starts saying that Susan was into him and she was like this seductress. They even started this website, which just like from the outside and from the title of the website, you would assume it's like a help find Susan kind of website, but it was actually just them like slaughtering her, just like annihilating her character. They tried to say that she was having this long-term affair with a local journalist named Stephen Kocher, and it was like so out of the blue. There was no link between the two at all, aside from the fact that they were both missing people from Utah. I mean, Josh was so controlling, I don't even know how she would have had an affair without him knowing about it. But what made this so weird is that like, yeah, this guy was from Utah, but he disappeared from Nevada, which is like not even close to Utah. It's all just really horrible, gross stuff, and they're still saying she left on her own, she's mentally ill, blah blah blah. So on the 25th of August, police get a search warrant to search the house that Josh and Steve and the two kids were living in. And it was there that they found like four hard drives, three computers, just filled with thousands of images of child pornography and thousands and thousands of images of Susan that had been taken without her knowledge. And these are Steven's computers, mind you. So all this child pornography was his, all these photos of Susan were taken by him when Susan and Josh were living with Steven after they got married. If you remember, I said he's a creep and we'll get into it a little bit later. This is later. We're talking about it. We're getting into it. Massive creep. Massive, massive, massive sleaze ball. So while Susan and Josh had been living with Steve, he was like, he would like follow her around with a camcorder. He would use a mirror to look in on her while she was in the bathroom. He would steal her panties out of her, like her underwear, out of her laundry baskets and out of her drawers. He even wrote love songs about her and he told her like, hey, I'm in love with you. And she was like, what the heck? And that is when they up and moved to Utah. And like I said, Josh was being a massive dick during this time too. And he was like, well, you're probably coming on to my dad. This is your fault that you feel uncomfortable because you're like trying to seduce him. Steven tried to argue that the feelings were mutual, which like gross, obviously they weren't. Like if they were mutual as well, why would you have to follow her around with a camcorder and do all of this like shady, creepy, sleazy stuff? It was probably the most erotic experience I've had in my entire life. I just I hate to say it. I mean, of course, I haven't had that many experiences, but Susan has been feeling ill. She had a cold, and I offered to rub her feet, to rub her toes, to give her some stimulation. That went on. I probably rubbed her feet, her toes, her beautiful feet. She has such pretty feet. Of course, everything about her is pretty beautiful. And I know she felt it. I mean, I know she, I mean, she couldn't have missed it. She's not naive either, I know, from what I've read in her journals. Um, that girl is not naive. When I started massaging her legs, I would have loved to go all the way up her legs, but I did do her calves because her feet were resting in my crotch, so I sort of rubbed her calves. She didn't seem to mind at all having me that close. I mean, I was close. I was touching her with my crotch. And I love that woman. She is so beautiful. I can't even get enough of her. can't get enough of looking at her. She's so, so pretty. It would be great to go to Colorado and, and see a different part of the U.S., you know? Yeah. <laughs> something that I shouldn't be interpreting, um, you know, and it just, for example, when we were sitting on the couch, it just felt like you were very, um, you know, and I mean, I was extremely aroused, and I think you were somewhat aroused, at least I thought. I don't know where you're going with this. But Susan, I don't, I, I, my, yeah, well, I'll tell you what I'm wearing. I'm married to your son, and I should just be the daughter-in-law. Father doesn't kiss me and you, you kiss me and I 
And on these hard drives, by the way, they found images of these two young, like, 8 and 10 year old girls that he had taken photos of them, like, nude while they were in the bathroom. They were his neighbours. And there was also, like, a bunch of just photos of women and their butts and their boobs. So after all of this was discovered, he was charged with 14 counts of voyeurism and one count of child pornography. In 2012, he was convicted and charged for the 14 counts of voyeurism, but the one count of child pornography was dismissed. So he went to prison, and while he was in prison in 2014, they reinstated the child pornography charge. He was convicted of it in 2015. And then he served another two years and was released from jail in 2017, but then died a year later from heart problems in 2018. But anyway, enough about that creep. Let's get back to the case. On the 28th of September in 2011, after all of this goes down in Steve's house where he's living with Josh and the two boys, Susan's parents, Judy and Chuck, are given custody of Josh and Susan's two children, Brandon and Charles. And they're four and six years old at this point. So Josh still has parental rights of the two boys at the moment, but they're in the care of their maternal grandparents. Now, Judy and Chuck had had some contact with the boys over the years, but not that much because Josh, like I said, was very controlling and he didn't really let them see their maternal grandparents all that much because he didn't want them to see the people who raised Susan because she was like such a sexual deviant and whatever. He didn't want them to see the people that raised her. So when they gained custody of them, they noticed that the boys had become really like physically violent with each other. And Charlie was also like doing and saying some really weird stuff at school, like some really disturbing stuff. He would tell kids at school that he didn't have a brother, that his mother and his brother were dead and that Mormons killed them. He told this one student at a school that he was gonna come to his house in the night and kill him all because he was a Mormon. Like after that happened, he had to go into school counseling and he told the school counselor that he wanted to kill that boy because he was a Mormon and that Mormons kill people. And so he deserved to die. Like it was all just really weird. Josh had left the LDS church and he, I guess, was like putting all these ideas in it, in their heads and he was like making them lie for him and all of this like just weird stuff. And then the worst part of it all is Charlie draws this really disturbing picture. It's like of the family and the family minivan and he's like, yep, this is dad, this is me, this is Brandon, and then mummy's in the trunk. Even after all of this, they didn't arrest Josh and they didn't like take his parental rights away from him. They didn't consider him a suspect and so his children still got to have supervised visits with him. Originally at facilities and then eventually he got to have these visits at his house. And he was also trying to go through the motions to get his children back and get custody of them back. And to do this, he was having to undergo parental and psychological evaluations. And then while all of this is happening, on the 1st of February in 2012, Josh has to go to court and he's like at court trying to, you know, get custody of his children back after going through all these evaluations and going through all the motions. And that's when it's brought into evidence that they found 400 computer generated child pornography images. It was so, it was really weird stuff. It was like cartoons of children. And then there was also characters from like The Simpsons, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Rugrats, The Flintstones, Superman, SpongeBob SquarePants. And they were all participating in like group sex, incest and sodomy and just like all of this creepy stuff. And the worst part of it all is that because they're not actual images, because they're just cartoons and computer generated and they're not actually children, it wasn't illegal. They couldn't arrest him, but they did order some psychosexual evaluations for him and they also ordered that for the foreseeable future, his children were going to stay with their grandparents, their maternal grandparents. But he's, he's still got to have his visits with his children at his house. Like, they didn't stop. Now, Josh and Susan's father, Chuck, do not get along. They don't like Josh. They think he's guilty. They think he's the reason Susan's missing, that he did something. There was some foul play involved. And Josh didn't like them either. So they had been in, like actual physical altercations in public. They just like talked a bunch of shit about each other in the media. They didn't like each other. So there was a social worker that would bring Brayden and Charlie from Chuck and Judy's house over to Josh's house for the supervised visits. 
There was no contact between the two men. They actually had restraining orders against each other. The social worker that would take them from one place to another and would supervise the visits was Elizabeth Hall. She became really close with the two boys and she picked them up from their grandparents' house on the 5th of February for one of their scheduled visits at Josh's house. Now obviously Josh was not a happy guy about the court ruling from just a few days ago. He wasn't happy that for the foreseeable future his kids were going to be in the care of their maternal grandparents. He just wasn't, he wasn't vibing. So what Elizabeth didn't know before this trip is that after the court hearing, Josh had gone and withdrawn $7,000 from his bank account. He then went and bought a bunch of gas from the fuel station, like just a bunch of different gas canisters. He had so much gas that he bought. He took them all home. He went and donated all of his children's toys to the thrift store. And then just before the visit on the 5th of February, he was like emailing his attorney and his family and he was basically just saying goodbye, I'm sorry. And he also left a voicemail for his family that said, I can't live without my children. I'm sorry, see you later. I'm sorry to everyone that I've hurt. So like I said, Elizabeth Hall knows nothing about any of this before their visit. So she goes to their visit on the 5th of February, just as scheduled. She pulls up at the house and the two boys jump out of her car and they run up to the front door to go see their dad because they're really excited. And she's just a step behind of them. She's just not running to the door like them because they're really excited. So they get to the door, Josh lets them in, then he looks at her, gives her this like really weird, like creepy little smirk and then slams the door in her face and locks it. She is obviously knocking on the door. She's yelling in. She's like, hey, you can't do this. Let me in the house, open the door. Then she starts to hear the two boys crying out, these really horrible, terrified screams. And they're only five and seven years old at this point. And it's later discovered that while they were crying out, Josh was actually attacking their faces with a hatchet. Then Elizabeth starts to smell gas. So immediately she calls 911 and this is just one of the most frustrating 911 calls I've ever heard in my entire life. This dispatch guy is just not taking this call seriously. He's not understanding the gravity of the situation and he gets stuck on like this really weird aspect of the call, right? So she's saying like, I'm a social worker. I'm supervising the visit for these two boys to visit their dad. And he's like, so who's supervising? She's like, well, me. And he's like, okay, but you're not allowed to supervise yourself. And she's like, no, I'm the supervisor. I'm supervising the two boys seeing their parent. And he's like, but you're not allowed. You can't supervise yourself. Who's supervising? And he, he just gets stuck on this for entirely too long. Eventually he's like, okay, we're going to send someone out there. And she's like, all right, how long till they'll be here? And he's like, well, you know, they'll get there when they get there. They have to attend to life-threatening emergencies first. And she's like, well, this is potentially a life-threatening emergency. I smell gas, the boys are yelling from inside the house, he just went to court a few days earlier, like it's this massive case. And he's like, okay, but has he ever outright said he was gonna murder the children? She's like, well, not to me, his social worker, hey? Like, not that I know. And the guy's like, all right, well, they'll get there when they get there. You know, it's, it's not really an emergency then, is it? Hey. I'm on a supervised visitation for a court-ordered visit, and something really weird has happened. The kids went into the house, and the parent, the biological parent, whose name is Josh Powell, will not let me in the door. What should I do? What's the address? It's 8119, and I, I think it's 89th. Um, I, I don't know what the address is. Okay. That's pretty important for me to know. I'm um, sorry, I can't. Just a minute. Let me get in my car and see if I can, if I can find it. I'm this. Nothing like this has ever happened before at um, these visitations. So I'm really um, shocked. And I could hear one of the kids crying, but he still wouldn't let me in. Okay, it is. Uh, but I think I need help right away. He, he's on a very short lease with CSHS and CPS has been involved. And this is the craziest thing. He looked right at me and closed the door. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm just waiting to know where you are. Okay. It's 8119. Whose house Stop is the it? the kids in the house and he won't let me in. It's a supervised visit. I understand. <laughs> Whose house is it? Josh Powell. Okay. So you don't live there, right? No. I don't. 
No, I'm contracted to the state to provide supervised visitation. I see. Okay. And and who is there to exercise their visitation? I am. Uh, and the visit is who? with Josh Powell. And who supervises? And he is the husband that I supervise. So you supervise and you're doing the visit? Yeah, you're I supervise supervising yourself? I supervise myself. I'm the supervisor here. Wait a minute. If it's a supervised visit, you can't supervise yourself. If you're the I visitor. I do supervise myself. I'm the supervisor for the supervised visit. Okay. Well, aren't you the one make, aren't you the one making the visit, or is there another parent I'm the one, that you're supervising? No. There's. I'm the one that supervises. I pick up the kids with their grandparents. Yes. And then who visits with the children? Josh Powell. All right, we'll have somebody look for you there. Okay, how long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. The first available deputy... Well, this, is could, this could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday, and he he didn't get his kids back. And this is really... I'm, a, I'm afraid for their lives. Okay, has he threatened the lives of the children previously? I have no idea. All right, we'll have the first available deputy contact you. So she gets off the phone, by the time someone gets there it's going to be way too late because as soon as she gets off the phone the entire house just explodes. Josh Powell who lost custody of his two boys after being suspected of killing his missing wife Susan back in 2009 killed himself and the children Sunday by setting the house on fire with a gas explosion. The fire and apparent explosion was so powerful it shook neighbors' homes and sent bits of insulation from the house raining down on the neighborhood. Eventually emergency services did arrive and they managed to put the fire out, but it had been over 20 minutes since the explosion and Josh had doused the entire house in gas, so the fire was huge, the explosion was huge, and nobody inside the house survived. Josh, Brayden, and Charlie all died in the explosion. The autopsies of the boys revealed that despite being attacked in the face with a hatchet, they actually died from smoke inhalation, which is just so sad. They were so excited to see their dad, and then they get in there, they survive this horrible hatchet attack, they survive and see this massive explosion, and then they die of smoke inhalation. A lot of people believe that this, along with the emails and the calls that he had sent his family and his attorney, like saying, I'm sorry for all of the people I've hurt, was him basically admitting to being responsible for Susan's disappearance and that he had killed her. Even though, like, to this day, they've never found Susan's remains, never found any trace of her. Her family was trying to get her officially pronounced as dead after this because they were 100% convinced that she was not missing, that Josh had killed her. Josh's sister Jennifer, the one who originally went to the house the day that Susan went missing and called 911, said that she knew it immediately from day one. In August of 2012, police released a lot of interesting new information. Apparently before Susan's disappearance, Josh withdrew his kids from daycare, he cancelled a bunch of her appointments, he talked to a co-worker about how to hide a body, and he also signed Susan up for like a $1 million life insurance policy. To make things even worse, there was a letter that was written by Susan which was found, which was like her last will and testament, and it basically said, if I die or go missing, just know it wasn't an accident, don't show this letter to my, my husband, Josh. She talked about her extreme marital distress, she said, I would never leave my sons. So that is extremely sketchy to say the least. They also released all of these really weird diary entries from Steve Powell's diary where he basically said that he thought Josh had killed Susan. Let me read you a little bit of these. So his first diary entry was at 12.35 a.m. on December 8th in 2009, so just 14 hours after Susan disappeared. And he said, I'm feeling sick. It is possible that Susan is dead. And then this is about the camping trip Josh said that he took. He said, the story is so implausible and our conversation with Josh is so unconvincing that I fear the worst. The whole thing sounds so wrong. Even if it had nothing to do with disposing of Susan's body, why would anybody do that? And he also talked about the fact that Michael and Alina, his other two children, didn't believe Josh's story either. They thought there was a lot of holes in it. And he said... 
Michael and Alina are very supportive of Josh and advised him to tighten up his story as it sounds weak and unconvincing. Josh responded that the police may have already tapped his phone, which was the same as saying, be careful what you say. In the last two weeks, Josh bought an oxy -acyl as Astaline <laughs> welder and a rug doctor carpet cleaner. I had no clue why he might want a welder, but now I wonder if it was required for the process of mutilating or disintegrating her body. He also wrote, years ago, I made up my mind that Josh was, of my kids, capable of doing such a thing. I want Josh to be with his boys, but I am also so angry with him for murdering such a beautiful woman. That he could do such a thing once suggests that he could do it again. If things go too badly, he could murder the boys and hang himself. This is all stuff that Josh's father, Steve, wrote in his journals. Then, to make things even sketchier, Josh's brother, Michael, he was the one that helped Josh move all of his stuff to his dad's house after Susan's disappearance. He was also named the main beneficiary of Josh's life insurance. Well... Police found out that Michael had gotten rid of his car in an abandoned junkyard in Oregon after Susan went missing, and then in February of 2013, he ended his own life. So very weird stuff. Susan's family sued the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services, claiming they were negligent in the deaths of Charlie and Braden, which I totally agree with. I mean, after everything that had been said and done and found, there was no way that they should have been getting home visits. Well, in July of this year, they actually won that suit and the jury awarded them over $98 million. Although in September of this year, the judge did reduce that to $32.8 million. Honestly, I couldn't really find too many theories about how Susan might have died. I feel like it's pretty obvious that Josh was responsible for her disappearance and probably murdered her. I did see one theory that was talked about a lot that maybe Josh poisoned her. If you remember, when police broke into the powerhouse the day Susan disappeared, there were these two big box fans pointing out these like wet parts on the carpet and like trying to dry these two wet parts on the carpet. But when police searched the house, they didn't really find any blood or any evidence of like blood having been cleaned up. So some people said that maybe they were just searching for the wrong thing and maybe these were actually trying to clean up her vomit because he'd poisoned her, she'd vomited, and he then, I guess, disposed of the body. I mean, it makes sense in terms of the fact that there was no signs of a struggle, no signs of a cleanup or anything like that. You know, if he poisoned her, there wouldn't be. And then he could very easily just transport her to somewhere where it was easier to dispose of the body. But yeah, that is everything that I have on this case. I would love to chat with you guys in the comments down below about what your theories are, what you think of the case, and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye guys!